Hey everyone, we're the Blood and Platelets podcast and we're back. After a bit of a hiatus, Brandon, Alex, and Chrissy are back and ready to spread those cancer killing, survivor inspired good vibes. We're changing it up a bit, expanding our circle beyond our three cancer surviving stories, and we'll be hosting guests each new episode to share their story and experience with the goal of spreading healing vibes and helping others in need of support. With that said, let's get into it. Brandon, why don't you introduce yourself since um, Paul knows us a, a little bit more. And then we'll have Paul, we'll have you do your intro because we'd love to kind of get who you are, your story, your experience, and what's brought you here today. So um, Brandon, you want to start? Yeah. Um, so I'm Brandon Ito. Um, Paul, it's great to meet you. Um, so my story is a little bit kind of different from Alex and Chrissy's. I was actually diagnosed with AML um, almost 24 years ago in 1999. Um, so I you know I went through the whole chemotherapy process and then I had a bone marrow transplant um, <clears throat> about six months after I was diagnosed with uh, my leukemia. And um, my search for a bone marrow donor was unique. Um, they did the whole like A3M. They did the whole, you know, recruiting process. Couldn't find anyone. Um, I have two brothers. So they tested my brothers. And they weren't even close to matching. <laughs> um, and then from those tests, they thought maybe a parent could be like a 50% match. Um, so they tested my parents. They looked at my dad's blood work first and he wasn't even close as well. And then they tested my mom and miraculously she was a perfect match, a 10 out of 10 match, um, which the doctors, nurses never even heard of. They said it was like a point zero 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 five percent chance of a parent fully matching like that they've seen parents match like 60 percent 50 percent but never a hundred percent um so yeah that was 20 it'll be 24 years in october wow. and yeah and um this podcast i i also started a nonprofit organization called my listeners foundation about 11 years ago we grant wishes for pediatric cancer patients um and this podcast is just another part of this post-cancer journey that is still part of i guess like a healing process and this void to always help that cancer community um i think that void's always going to be there um but this podcast it's just another outlet and yeah we thank you for coming on and sharing your story and i hope you we you know help you help others and other any way we can so thanks for being here of course oh my gosh 24 years yeah that's incredible congrats thank you thank you <laughs> yeah what, what do they call a transplant when it's uh, from a, a relative like a brother or sister or parent is it called oh, a haploid? God. or a haplo? Uh, it sounds fam- yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. I just call it a miracle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you are a living, breathing miracle for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Paul, um, you know, obviously, <laughs> Alex and I, and now Brandon, have been introduced to, but since this is a podcast, I would love for you to say who you are and. Um, obviously, you know, we've brought you on to share your story, um, as a survivor. Um, but, but sort of, you know, I don't actually also know all the background. I mean, I, your mom and I have talked, um, when you were going through treatment, um, mostly to sort of like help understand what, what's normal, you know, quote unquote normal, what's, what are, what are things that, you know, she could do to help, et cetera. Um, you know, Alex and I just kind of giving you moral support. Um, but, More than that. <laughs> but I, I would, I would love to hear like, you know, what you were doing before um, everything happened, how old you were when you were diagnosed and what were you diagnosed with? And then sort of like the progression from there. So 
would love to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, I was diagnosed at 25 with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and uh, yeah, before that I was, I was getting my foot in the film industry. I was working, you know, on set and I even had some, some really exciting gigs as a camera operator for um, that show Whale Wars. Did you don't know that one on Discovery Channel? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So I was shooting that show with like a small team of five, you know, and it, it was in the middle of the ocean and it was like high stakes and it was like a real adventure. And um, so that was kind of like what I was doing before I was diagnosed with cancer. Was that like off um, the coast of Japan somewhere? It was, it was supposed to be in Antarctica, but um, the ships we were following were trying to evade us. So we ended up <laughs> in the South China Sea, Whoa. In the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Wow. It was really exciting. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it was so crazy that they made a TV show out of it because it was so crazy. Yeah. And yeah. so we were there filming it. Um, and, you know, it was a really formative experience. I thought, okay, this could be a big jumping off point to do like more nature, environmental documentaries, travel the world, do that stuff. And then, you know, over the course of three months, I just thought I had a really bad cold or something or like the flu. And then uh, eventually, um, right before I was diagnosed, I went blind in one eye. Um, essentially, my blood was so, there was so many white blood cells that I started to have hemorrhages in my my softer like my really delicate blood vessels in my eye so in my retina oh, i was my hemorrhaging blood they would just explode so the real danger is that oh my god you have like crazy. a brain aneurysm yeah yeah and, wait were you uh, on a boat when this was happening no we, i i come back i maybe been home for like oh. six months or something oh, and oh thank god thank goodness yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it really, you know, acute means quickly. So it happened very fast. Um, and then, you know, three months, I was feeling weird by that last month. I was feeling extremely sick, couldn't walk up the stairs and, and then I was blind. So I went to the doctor and, you know, they told me to go to the hospital immediately uh -huh. and they wouldn't tell me why really they just said you need to go to the hospital and then I went to the hospital and didn't leave for 40 days oh. they just started the induction chemotherapy um and that was the beginning of the uh life with cancer you didn't go uh -huh. see the doctor until like a <laughs> couple months after you were experiencing these flu-like symptoms yeah I didn't go for months because it was so subtle at first. You just don't notice it as it increases subtly over time, you know? And I was young. I had just gotten off of a ship that traveled around the ocean chasing pirates. Like, you know, I was just like, oh, I'll just shake it off. I'm fine. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And I, I started to work out harder. I started because I was getting frustrated why I was getting so fatigued, why I was so weak. So I started work out more and I couldn't work out as much and I was, I was really like didn't understand what was going on I was hurting myself but um, the blindness you know some other issues immediately red flags and finally went to the hospital yeah and, and then and then everything started I would wow. do um, chemotherapy for three years uh, and then Right when I was done with chemotherapy, that was when the pandemic started. And, you know, going, we went through the pandemic for that first year. And then I relapsed. My cancer came back uh, December 2020. 
kind of at the height of the pandemic when yeah were, you know yeah. the death cases were reaching right like half a million this was three years after your initial diagnosis i have four years four i had one year where i didn't have to do any chemo before it relapsed so they didn't oh. they didn't tell you to go to transplant right away they just said let's treat this with regular like let's see if we can just chemo kill it with chemo first then because i know you can't go to transplant until you're under a certain yeah last well, ratio but mm -hmm. they gave me also, the yeah. option it was okay. ultimately my choice they said you can go to transplant but you do not have a strong match and it could be risky uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, you know, I remember the way they presented it to me was like, there's a 20% chance that it could be fatal. I was like, 20% chance? I know. I just can't. I was given that. Yeah. I was given that percentage at one point, And it's like, yeah. it's one in five. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, or, and what kind of, oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, what kind of um, transplant were options were you given? Um, I don't remember back then like i eventually would get the stem cell transplant okay um you know that's what i did when i relapsed uh but during the first cancer diagnosis um they just said you could go to city of hope and they would pound it out that's what they said <laughs> they do they do transplants like all the time you would just get a transplant yeah yeah and that was really scary because i was at you know i i was i just found out i had cancer like three days prior, they told me, you know, uh, there's like a 60% chance of relapse, but, you know, you, you're not Philadelphia, you don't have these other genetic cases where you presents higher risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't pass the test for like completely, you know, safe or whatever, but I didn't have the most egregious like genetic chromosome or the genetic markers that would indicate a struggle for, for survival. Right. So I just was like, I'll do chemotherapy for three years and, uh, and we'll just go with that. Cause 20% was just unacceptable. It's just so scary. Um, I didn't really, realize you know how terrible three years of chemotherapy would be as well though yeah um, i yeah. mean it all sucks there's no it all no sucks yeah. yeah yeah so by the time the relapse happened you said that was december of 2020 yeah um, amazing timing um <laughs> and uh, that was brutal <laughs> yeah so were you, were you in the hospital um, I mean, talk about that yeah. with like this, just one, the fear of what you're going to go through. It's come back. Mm -hmm. It's always the cancer patient's worst fear. But then on top of that, we're in this pandemic and people are dying of this virus. I mean, how mm -hmm. did, how did you cope with that? How did you, how did your doctors talk to you and did they lay out a game plan? Like how, how, how was that? It was it was like this. So, you know, I'm, I'm living in Las Vegas at the time. My fiance, like my now fiance, she had, she was working in Las Vegas. So we moved there. Now we're back in LA, but we moved to Las Vegas and we spent the first year of the pandemic in Las Vegas quarantining. And I was feeling really strong. You know, I was recovering from chemo I was in remission I thought you know cancer was done I did my three years and it should be all good and I was getting really active again I was feeling really strong there's like a national park right outside of Las Vegas so I, I was going on hikes a lot and it was Thanksgiving and you know I'm feeling really good like I also shot a feature film during my first cancer you know just a part of the like drive to survive and and chasing your dreams. So I was feeling really good despite quarantine and the pandemic, but we, um, we were just eating Thanksgiving dinner alone. It was really nice. And, you know, I was just feeling 
my neck and I felt a lump on my neck and oh. it was like one of the worst instances of your life because you know that's not supposed to be there and it mm -hmm. you know for us if it's not supposed to be there it's not good mm -hmm. um so I called my doctor and I could tell immediately that she was extremely concerned and uh she passed me along I no longer was under her care like immediately I came I had to go back to LA for tests and she handed me off to USC um the Norris Cancer Norris and oh. Keck Cancer yeah. Center uh -huh. um and uh I did a lymph node biopsy and it was the cancer had relapsed. So, you know, the, the pandemic just made it all worse because I had to do everything completely alone and the rules on visitation were extremely strict. Um, it was brutal because, you know, you feel strong and alive and you think you beat cancer. And then they tell you, Oh no, you're not strong at all. In fact, it's way worse than the first diagnosis because the, uh, uh the cancer cells had, had, uh, gone into my CNS. So my, my spinal fluid in my brain, which is mm. a big, uh, scary thing to happen for ALL patients, as I imagine other leukemia patients. Um, so immediately intrathecal chemo into the spine twice a week, three times a week, uh, you know, got the bags. I mean, this is all terrible, right? Like I'm talking yeah. to people that truly understand this, like, and then Ugh. on top of that, I couldn't have my family or anyone there. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's rough. Yeah. I remember I got in the hospital and, you know, I thought I'd beat it. And then I'm staring down at the bed again. And like, even now thinking about it, I can feel like the horror of that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't sit down on it for a long time. I just kind of refused to sit on it. Yeah. And, uh, and then someone came in and I'm like crying and they hand me an iPad with instructions in like, type 25 font teaching me how to use an iPad to talk to my relatives. I was like, Oh my God, that's right. You know, I'm not supposed to be in here. I'm not supposed to be this young person who knows yeah. how to use an iPad. I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. How did you, stuff. so gosh, what, what were some of the things you did I mean, was it was it just a daily reminder of like, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, and that was sort of the mantra. You, I mean, what what did you do, especially because you had no outside connection? I mean, yeah, I was following your story on Instagram at that time, and you were making these like little short films um, about your experience, yeah. and I I thought those were amazing. I, I couldn't. I couldn't wait to see the next recording that you posted, but <laughs> from your, your recordings, I, I couldn't tell like you were going through something so traumatic. Like you, you displayed a lot of courage and uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's just amazing from hearing what you're saying now, but please continue. <laughs> no, yeah. I would, I would make these like little, skits like sketches like i'd have my iphone and i just i record some some videos some update videos but yeah i should have just i should have been putting it on tiktok you know yeah. <laughs> waste wasted it on instagram no. <laughs> i do remember just... like going through the first cancer i really regretted not taking more videos and sharing more on social media because you're just so consumed yeah. and and yeah you know i don't post on social media like a lot I've had to do a lot more because of what I'm doing. The movie, like, yeah. You know, uh -huh. um, but I was like, okay, this cancer, I'm going to stay more in touch with the outside world, especially because there, You're all by yourself. there's no, yeah, I'm all by myself. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I so, mean, mm-hmm. I guess what a benefit to have social media. I mean, we know the negative aspects of social media, but ha- thank goodness you had social media. I mean, Brandon, when Brandon was going through his stuff, <laughs> I, I yeah, had like, there's no Wi-Fi. I had to use yeah. dial-up internet. Yeah. And the, oh my god! This is if I didn't have internet. I don't know. This is pre- how did you get through it? Yeah, literally a little <laughs> eight by eight TV with like basic cable. That's that's yeah. all I had. There's, there yeah. were no iPads, yeah. no and a remote that like you just yeah it only went one way. Channel so by you, channel, so if you skipped one channel, you <laughs> go going. all the way around. What? True yeah. hero. Yeah. Super, super <laughs> That's Mario criminal. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So, like, I only have like two photos while I was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And those are the only ones that I cycled because there weren't, you had to use like film camera. Yeah. Or like, yeah. Um, I couldn't just snap photos on my on my yeah. phone. It's, yeah, yeah it's crazy. Yeah. Oh, I, no. <laughs> I think, I think you made a really good point, Paul. Like, I didn't. I didn't post a ton. I mean, I posted enough, but like, I also, like you said, like it was not my focus. I just wasn't, I was, I just was either a too exhausted or B. I was just kind of like, yeah, I also had, I was, I was in the hospital when it wasn't COVID. I was pre COVID. So I had four people in my room at any given time Mm -hmm. um, talking to me. Right. So I, you know, I didn't have a ton of like the, but I think, it actually is, I think it's a really, I wish I had done more of it because like I was looking back uh, recently and there was something that I saw on Instagram of Alex of your journey and maybe it was from Be The Match when they put their reel together and like there's all these pictures and videos of you going through it and then Paul, like Alex just, I, when you said that Alex about his shorts that his little mini films i remember that and i think that is such a creative and useful way of documenting this highly traumatic experience and for people who may be listening that are about to go into it or are going through it you know it i think it sounds like something that we've all said like yeah we're glad we have it because you can kind of look back at it in their in therapeutic ways of being like, yes, this this is what happened, and it was horribly traumatic, and it was difficult, and it was challenging physically and emotionally. But now I'm here, and now I've made it through, and you know it's a big part of your life. So, I, can you tell people what that the film was called that that short one that you made um, the during your first bout with cancer? It was like that mini documentary. What was that called again? I made um, two short films and a feature film during my first cancer. Um, the two short films were called Leafer and Six Windows. And then the feature film was called Evergreen. Evergreen. Um, they were all like yes. narrative. Yeah. Um, and where where could where where can we watch them? Like where can people watch them? On YouTube? How you do can, people find it? You can watch um, the short films on my YouTube channel, um, and you can watch the feature film on Amazon. And we have a new feature film now. Um, you know, each time I get cancer, you're just making a feature film helps, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, we have a new feature film now uh, that's out, and we've been kind of touring the country with it. It's been getting a lot of really fun attention and um is that no no girl no no girl Mm -hmm. oh what that's that is partly uh related to your your cancer experience story it's more related to my childhood growing up japanese american okay and how this how the family in this story has to figure out what to do with what was left behind during the incarceration of their Mm. grandparents Right. It was uh, about right. a, a yonsei, right? Like a, yeah. Which is well, fourth generation? Fourth, fourth generation. generation. Right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. you, your, you yourself are yonsei? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Brandon, like myself, story. and Paul are. Yep. You guys are all yonsei. All, okay. three, yep. all three of us are yonsei. Yeah. Nice. We all, yeah. Nice. All of our grandparents were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
did you did you start writing that script during your second like during the transplant did you start kind yeah. of conceptualizing it then yeah um definitely was writing it during you know besides you know i was alone so i had a lot of time but i was also like i didn't stay at usc um for my bone marrow transplant usc was having a real tough time during the pandemic it was you know um they were they were they had a lot to handle a lot of volume yeah. there were overflows and there was there were like covid patients on the floor with the bone marrow transplant patients it was kind of rough Ooh. um yeah they had them on the same floor <laughs> yeah oh boy That's i know cool. yikes yeah and it what made it worse i mean i don't want to I don't want to, USC was, they had a lot to handle, but I went to City of Hope and had a really great experience there. You know, yeah, they took care of me really well. Mm -hmm. They had an amazing facility and it was there that I could really, you know, the stress, uh, you know, the treatments were so brutal, right? Like with the yeah. intrathecal chemos, I had, the, you guys had this, the spinal fluid chemo injections. No, we, I did not. So do you want to ex just explain that? Like what they do? Yeah. They just, okay. they stick a needle in your spine and then they push chemotherapy in, into it. So I think I've done like over 60 of those. Oh, wow. Maybe like, yeah. I've so, done a lot. So do they I do like the spinal tap at the same time? Cause I've had spinal taps done. Yeah. So when they do that, they tap. just inject the chemo at the same time mm -hmm. gotcha yeah and it was oh. usually like high dose methotrexate oh uh, yeah uh so you know i was doing those multiple times a week but it causes these it, it causes an imbalance of pressure in your like your brain has a pressure like a like a airplane cabin or something uh -huh. so uh -huh. when you leak fluid out of the spinal tap you know the spinal fluid in your brain loses that pressure it causes these massive headaches and um, like for months i was dealing with that um it was so debilitating like you start to like like hallucinate and stuff oh my gosh um, yeah i mean this was a question about the script writing but this is like you can't write a script i wanted to write this story, I was like, okay, I'm just going to pour all my creativity and all of my mind into writing the script. But, you know, I, I couldn't because of, yeah. because of yeah. the treatments and the drugs sure. and the stress of like, is someone on this floor with COVID going to get me really, really sick? Mm -hmm. um, but at City of Hope, there was, it was, a, there was none of that. It was quarantine no more spinal taps, just radiation and bone marrow transplant. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, man, that is brutal. Yeah. That is brutal. But how incredible that what came out of this is now this amazing feature film that you really had wanted to put together and you were able to do that. I mean, that's really incredible i mean did, was there a turning point in the um treatment like did you have a turning point after like once you got your transplant once you got your stem cells mm -hmm. did you start was there a moment where you were like okay i feel like maybe something's gonna get better or because I, I remember like the first two weeks i was in the hospital and it was the first two weeks after I received my stem cells on that Friday, nothing happened. Like no counts moved, nothing happened. And I was like very scared, very depressed, very much like what is going on? Is this not working? Like, is this not working? And, um, and then all of a sudden, and my doctor was, as you, as we all know, like they're so amazing there. Like my doctor never, faltered she was never mm -hmm. worried she was like no it just takes time 
we'll see. We'll see, you know? Yeah. And sure enough, it was like almost two weeks exactly to the day. And that next morning after the midnight blood draw, they posted the numbers in the morning and it was like it had gone up 0.1, you know? And that it was one like, blood <laughs> cell. Oh! Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So did you have, like, that was, for me, that was my moment where I was like, okay, something's working. This is going to get better. Um, and for me, mentally, that really helped. But did you have something like that happen can, that you can recall? Or, or was it more just a steady, steady, like, perseverance? I think the thing, and I remember that really made a difference. Um, you know, just like you, nothing happens, um, right? Yeah. Uh, the radiation, the bone marrow transplant is really painful. So, you know, it feels like your body's turning inside out. And uh, it was it was just hard to get through for the first two weeks of that. And I had been alone for like four months doing all the treatments. Oh, my God. So my it God. was just, it was like a real test. Like, how bad do you want this? How bad do you want to live? Yeah. And I wasn't concerned about my blood count. I don't remember being like, what's my numbers? I was just like fuck this just <laughs> survive today yeah and the real thing that changed for me was that city of hope changed their policy one day and they allowed a visitor um mm-hmm. but they they had to stay in the room with me they couldn't leave mm-hmm. so my fiance v came in and she stayed in the room with me for two weeks mm-hmm. Amazing. Wow. And know. that that gave you strength to fight on and the spirit that was wasn't oh. there prior to that, right? I can just yeah. feel it. Oh. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. It, Paul. it makes it it makes a huge difference, man, to have somebody yeah. there to just for all kinds of support, not just emotional, but yeah. just a voice, a, a person that you could feel like yeah. you know in your heart and in, in your hand and yeah the it energy of trans- them yeah. yeah i mean i'm getting emotional right thinking about it yeah. but yeah like it was just like being on a deserted island of pain and then having a lifeline yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know i think we all felt like we were on a deserted island but you were on a more deserted island than we we I mean, ever yeah. imagined. You, know you were on another like, planet. Yeah, like we were yeah. on Mars. <laughs> we were at least still on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is so brutal, yeah. but uh, that that's incredible. And that it, I feel like there's two things that you said are like really amazing. One is that you did survive those four and a half months in solitude, dealing with this incredible pain and illness and struggle and my god what a testament to the power of the willpower of of saying like you just said like fuck just survive today just Mm -hmm. just survive today i'll get to tomorrow tomorrow you know yeah yeah um that's incredible and then the second part of that of, of of then what it really does like just having that human connection with someone else is is everything it's like everything um it's it's god's it it is it's (laughs) it's energy of someone else and and just knowing you're not alone and you know mark did the same thing i mean he he didn't leave for almost three weeks um he stayed in the hospital um Mm -hmm. and the first the first night that he went home because he was like i needed you know i need to go back and do laundry And, and i was getting better at this point so it's like not as but i i like totally freaked out that first night and <laughs> called him and yeah. i was crying i was like i don't think i could do this man. can you come back please and, and he did mm-hmm. and you know it's like i think for people who are um you know scared about going through something like this um the fear is real but like knowing that you have support and knowing that you have someone there that can really be like that lifeline for you is so important. And it's so amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I like, I, ha- I, I, 
felt that, Paul, when you're talking about that. Oh my gosh, I Same. can't I... even imagine what your wedding is going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're getting married in two months. Oh, oh congrats! Mm -hmm. yeah, congrats! That's yeah. so great. That's so yeah. great. That's just amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Things things are going very well right now. Yeah. In fact, so how... last weekend. Yeah. Well, last last weekend was the two years since my bone marrow transplant. Yes. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Birthday. Yeah. Your new birthday. Amazing. Yeah. Oh my Happy gosh. Your birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about yeah, you guys, but when they gave me the 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 bone marrow transplant like in the bag and you watch it go in and you know yeah. this is gonna be really painful and you're just laying there that first night. I was completely alone, so maybe that also added to the weirdness of it, but I was just laying <laughs> there and then all the nurses come in. And they start singing me happy birthday. <laughs> I was just like, is this You're like, what's going like on? So <laughs> of Twilight Zone or something? Yeah, <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. It I got so like a surreal. balloon. I don't, I don't even think I got a singing. Um, but I also felt like yeah. it was very anticlimactic. I was like, that's it? Like, I guess we're yeah. done now? Yeah. Like, just a bag? I appreciate the whole sentiment of like, you're getting a new bone marrow, but. Um, yeah, I was just so, I was a little creeped out, <laughs> but I, I understand, you know, totally why it's a thing. Yeah, yeah I, and, I think that's okay. I think that's normal, yeah. normal feeling. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Two years. That's amazing. And so you're doing well, you feel good. You are, yeah. count flies are healthy. May I ask yeah. you who, who your donor was? Oh yeah. It was, it was my sibling, Lori. Oh, oh really? cool. Yeah. My sister. My sister, oh, wow. yeah. We did um the A three M and all the bone marrow matches. Mm -hmm. Right. And um you know something, Chrissy, I don't know if I ever told you, but when I was fourteen, I did a cheek swab for you. Really? And, yeah. And no I didn't know what leukemia was. Oh my and, gosh. Because I remember Dr. Shinto came up to me and he's like, Paul, um, you know. You're Hapa. <laughs> you're Hapa. Yeah, and I think it would be really important if you registered for the bone marrow, uh, did the bone marrow drive in the gym. And I didn't know what any of that was. So I went, I was oh like, um, I'm going to have to talk to my parents first. <laughs> <laughs> And my to DNA my... to random <laughs> yeah, strangers. Like, this sounds crazy. What? You're like, my dentist told me to do this. Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But my parents were oh, like, so you should do it. And then, oh, yeah. Wow. And then I went in and did the cheek swab for you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I had no idea what leukemia was. I learned a little bit about leukemia wow. you know, over the next couple of days after that cheek swab. Man, that's wow. Well, thank you. For doing yeah, it didn't, it didn't really work. <laughs> no, you wouldn't but... have wanted mine anyways. What would that have yeah, been like? I guess, right? Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> well, imagine. You know, it all works uh, out for a reason, though. I she, guess she yeah. would. She would need a refund. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, That's... so so your sister was your donor. That's incredible. And then. uh this two years, you're at your two year mark. What when's your actual um anniversary? Like birthday? Stem cell um, birthday? Yeah, it was March, I think it was like March twelve. Oh my gosh, so it was like oh, literally it oh, Yeah, it was last, last weekend. Last, last, oh, last happy Sunday. belated. One week ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, week ago. oh my gosh. Yeah. Congrats. Oh Robbie. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. My dad wants to come yeah. in and be a part oh, of it. He, he wants <laughs> to congratulate you. Yeah. Yes. He heard Thank you. he heard it is your birthday, so he's like, very excited about <laughs> you. <Yeah. laughs> um well that's great. So okay, so now what is what does life look like now? Um well like we have this movie I'm, I'm promoting and spreading this movie around. We're going to film festivals and sharing it with so many people in the Japanese American community um, in LA, Southern California and the Bay area. And we've been to like Sacramento and Stockton and Portland and Eugene. And we were in Austin and DC. It's just been like kind of blowing up a little bit. 
Um, and it's all about this Japanese American family. It's this movie about Japanese American people today and what they had to, you know, how they're still being affected from the trauma of, of World War II and mm -hmm. incarceration. And people are li liking it. I mean, I'm hesitant to right. say much about like how I feel about it because it feels so superstitious, but <laughs> yeah. it's it's going well. I think that movie is so much tied into my recovery because you know after the bone marrow transplant you get home and you're finally out of the hospital and around your family again and you can't really walk you know you're so weak everything's like on a knife's edge you have no yeah. immune system and so i just like started writing emails and um i got i reached out to this like kind of idol of mine Chris Tashima who he won an Oscar in uh, the late 90s for uh, a short film um, mm. called Vices and Virtues that he directed and starred in so he's like an Oscar winning director and actor and he's one of the only Japanese Americans to ever win an Oscar period oh, wow. and I reached out to him I, I think the headline was like cancer survivor filmmaker wants to make his second feature film or something, you know, just fully yeah. lean into that. Cause yeah. We, all, yeah. we just, hey, man, you earned that card. Yeah. You, earned you, can that see, card. you can always play that card. That's yeah. that card. Who yeah. would take that away from you? But, no. Yeah. So I sent him an email and then I sent him the script and he liked the script so much. He, he asked if there was any part, like any way he could be a part of it. And oh, now, yeah. Now I had him locked into a role that I kind of wrote with him in mind. Like, if I could have someone play this role, it'd be no crazy. way. Yeah, but I just thought it was a long shot. You know, this guy is like, he's a serious, serious deal. And so he got on the project. And when he got on the project, I emailed the whole crew. Like, my, my, no, my Evergreen movie crew, like, we were tight. We've done all these films together. They supported me through cancer. They're like some of my closest friends too. We all just got stoked and I was like, okay, we're going to shoot in November because I'm going to do the bone marrow transplant and shoot this movie in the same year. And it's going to be crazy. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Man. I know. Wow. It was. I like it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and that we is did so it. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. You did yeah, it. Yeah. We totally did it. It was like. You know, I'm on set and my hair grew back all curly. So I have like I know, this yeah. weird curly hair. Yeah. And um, yeah, we totally shot the movie. And and now, you know, two years later, two years after uh, the transplant, I can I can celebrate like its release. So it just is kind of yeah. incredible. It's all happening right now. Yeah. Was that a big part of, I guess, your treatment or your healing process like you you saw the vision of like this film now you're like i have to be cancer i have to be well in order to get this done did that really drive you um during like your your treatment or healing process yeah uh, totally because you know it was kind of the only thing that i was doing that was aimed at the future you know like mm -hmm. there was nothing else i was doing where i imagined uh, a life you know mm -hmm. i was just like you know you, until you got cancer you just assume you're gonna die now and you're gonna get really sick and then you're gonna die yeah. it's kind of bleak um but writing the script is like this subconscious little fight because yeah if i'm writing this script I'm going to shoot it. And if I'm going to shoot it, that means I'm going to be out of the hospital. I'm going to be healthy yeah. enough to shoot. I'm going to, I'm going to have something in the future. So in a way it was like maybe the only thing that was giving me hope, you know, tangibly, you know, of course my family and my friends and all that, but personally for me, there was no, I didn't, I wasn't making birthday plans. You know, I was yeah. just writing this script and it was kind of, yeah, it was like that little fight. And That's making awesome. the movie was the completion of it. Wow. The power of your subconscious. 
a little bit. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 That's incredible. You know, I was watching the Oscars last week and I was having like these visions of Mr. Paul Goodman accepting his award winning things. Yeah. Know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, I was talking to yes. you last week and then the Oscars came on and, you know, your films and, yeah, I can totally see it. I can totally see it down the line. And that would be amazing. Ki <laughs> Hui Kwan looked into the camera and pointed. It felt like he was pointing at me. He was just like, yeah. follow your dreams. I yeah. Like, was. Right? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It was. That's amazing. I think yeah, we he was all pointing at all of us. That. Yeah. 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 But, that was yeah. incredible. But yes, I agree with Alex. I'm waiting, uh, waiting for... Uh, your category and your nomination to happen for no no girl. I've been yeah, wanting, let's... I've been dying to see it. So are you yeah, going to be wait. able to come back and do more screenings in LA? Yeah. So living back in LA, um, we had a run of screenings in like October, September, October, kind of yeah. like August, September, October. And um, we had like, we sold like 2000, there were like 2000 people came to see it in those, like in those great. limited screenings. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And and that kind of jump started the rest of the tour. But now that we've done all these other cities and stuff, I think there's more there's more attention for another screening in Southern California. And I I think we're gonna try and schedule a couple, you know, uh in the summertime. Hopefully oh, we can great. do like a week or something. That'd be oh, awesome. We will we will be there. Yeah, I would definitely love, be I there. Would, yeah, that'd be awesome. Keep us posted on that. Yeah, and we'll post I will. it on the podcast. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, we want to get you some. Uh, I mean, with all of our many, I need the blood and platelet. Fifteen bump. listeners, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna put this on uh, my social media and everything. I love. This yeah, podcast. great, good, good, good. Well, with that, then I mean, we I don't it's it's uh we're almost at time but what i want to do is i want to i love for you to with that said how like you have anything for those that are currently experiencing right what we where we were and this is really the point of the podcast is to give people who are either in their current fight or have are just beginning it or are just coming out of it out right of it, yeah um, is there anything that you would say to yourself back then, you know, like now where you are, is there anything we always talk about, like what we would, what, what kind of, what things would we want to hear ourselves, you know, but is there anything that you have that you've kind of like mm -hmm. settled on where you, you want to share? Um, you know, something that I think is really reassuring now is that the technology is getting so good. Like even with leukemia, when I started leukemia, there was no CAR T cell, there was no blimp right. tubal mab, there was no, there was none of these things where now it's kind of common and you can get these really advanced great procedures. I imagine it's the same across many different cancers. So in a kind of weird and sick way like you just have to survive a little bit longer like <laughs> the technology is going to be there very soon we're getting really good at treating these diseases and i can't speak for all cancers right we can i can only speak for you know i can all, really only speak for acute lymphoblastic leukemia b cell and you know, for those going into cancer treatments right now, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's you know, so bone, tough. Bone marrow transplants have only been around for like 40 some years or yeah, something. Yeah, 40 or 50 years. You yeah. know, and, that like was, prior, and that was my prior. only option was bone marrow at the time. Yeah, but, they didn't do stem cells back then. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so you're right. I agree. Huh? The medical technology is advancing and if you could hang on, you know, like, yeah, your chance, your chances will get better year after year. Every yeah. day you survive, the chances get better and better for you to find yeah. a cure. I believe it too, and the registry is gaining mm -hmm. more. Donors growing, and yeah, it's growing up. Yeah, 
Yeah. I think we should make a t-shirt from Paul and it's going to say <laughs> just effing survive today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's how we That'll be the title it. of the this one just effing survive. Effing <laughs> survive today. I think this yeah. if I was to give like legitimately one piece of advice that would pretty much be it. Just get yeah. through the day. The day. Hold on to the things that make you feel strong. Friends, family or writing a script or whatever it is, you know, just F and survive today and then <laughs> F and survive tomorrow, but worry about that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love that. That's great. That's so great. Thank you, man. Yeah. Paul, yeah, I think so you much, guys, Paul. you're amazing, well, dude. Like, thank you. You are. You, you really guys were are. such a big help when I was going through well, it was before transplant. You were guys were such big mentors. You relaxed me. You made me feel like I was, you know, if this was, this is going to work and it's going to be okay. So wow. I really appreciate that. From I'm so from glad. Now. I'm really glad that, that, that it, it did help you. We, we were thinking about you a lot. Still do. Um, but yeah, anytime you need a cheerleading section, Brandon, Alex <laughs> and I are there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but thank you, man. Thank you for your time, for sharing your story. I think it's so incredible what you went through and survived. I think it's amazing. So, all of us. So happy you're here. So yeah. happy. Yeah. You didn't even have internet. No. Nope. That's, <laughs> That's the worst no. one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it thinking really back is. now, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Hell, I had nothing. To do, oh, yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> like a doodle pad. <laughs> and like, I'm not a reader, so like, I didn't read any books. It was, yeah, yeah, just a true hero. <laughs> oh. Yeah, my <laughs> oh, man. Did you have Nintendo? <laughs> they did, but I'm, I'm not a video a video yeah, game okay. person either. So <laughs> I know that probably the six months I was in the hospital, my brain probably just turned to mush, <laughs> counting yeah. the drops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Out of the bag. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. You're counting the days, scr- making yeah. scratches on the wall. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> like uh, scratches yeah. on the wall. <laughs> Different times. Uh, Different uh, times. Like we said, technology is really advanced. <laughs> great. Yeah. In more than one way. Oh my oh, god. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you, Paul. Yes. Thank you again. Thanks it's again, so Paul. To, so good to see you. Thank you. Please. Thank you Great everyone. to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. will you send us the dates when you do do your? Do you set up new screenings for the film? Definitely. Oh, we would yeah. love to go and 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 I want to promote the heck out of it. So. Yeah, I'll definitely send you guys once once we figure out uh, a venue. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody have a good rest of your Sunday evening. Yes, stay warm and dry. Yeah. 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 Stay healthy. Yes. Yes. Yeah, stay, stay healthy. healthy. Guys. Right on. All right. All right. Okay. Take care. See ya, See ya everyone. Okay. Yeah, everyone. Bye. Bye.